get into the mindset for this preview, I wanted to be just like a real AEW fan. So I have not showered in three days. Oopsie, the worst rapper alive. Oops. Yeah, yeah. Big Max back on the mic like oops. Back on the horse, still jumping through hoops. The missing link in pink, I don't lip sync. Just to be clear, choking isn't my kink, but I do it anyway sometimes, I guess. Gotta laugh now, die later in my times of stress. I'm blessed, feeling good, charged up like a Hadouken. Mota Zitabanake, see, welcome into the Worst Wrestling Podcast. I am your host with the least and the most bedhead right now, Jack Lucene. Uh, I am pre-recording this at 5.51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. You're like, what in the hell are you doing up this early? This is just how early I get up every day. And I got so much shit going on today that I had to get this out of the way ASAP. So we are doing a preview and predictions show for AEW All In. We are stepping into the AEW world uh, so, you know, this won't be a, uh, I guess what you would call an original AEW podcast. You know, this is not a true representation of AEW fans because I've had sex before. Now I'm fucking around. Uh, I'm going to uh, stop bragging on AEW fans. I love AEW. Uh, in fact, I think it could uh, stand to be even more hardcore than it already is. I was you know, bought in on the idea that this was supposed to be more of a sports representation as opposed to an entertainment representation in uh, the realm of sports entertainment. And at times they honor that. And at other times I think, uh, you know, they, they get lost in the sauce a little bit trying to compete with WWE and the theatrics uh, going on over there. But I am very excited for AEW All In. I am a huge, huge Daniel Bryan fan, a.k.a. Bryan Danielson, a.k.a. the American Dragon. Uh, and obviously, uh, his main event match for the AEW World Heavyweight Championship against Swerve Strickland, career versus title. I am here for it, baby. But before we get into the main event, let's run through this card. Um, there's some stuff on here I frankly had to Google because, uh, again, I'm coming in a little bit cold. I do not watch AEW uh, on a regular basis in terms of, like, their weekly programming. I'm not tuned in, to be perfectly honest. Uh, for such a small company, I feel like three shows a week is too much. Every now and again, I'll catch a dynamite, uh, but that's about it. Uh, for the most part, though, I do still watch all the pay-per-views. Um it's kind of how I used to consume my WWE content, to be honest, uh, until, you know, WWE finally picked it up on the weekly shows with the storytelling. Uh, but uh, as far as, like, the actual pay-per-view is concerned, there's some stuff on here that I'm really looking forward to, and then there's some stuff on here that I frankly could do without. So let's start with that. Um <laughs> I don't know what an all-in zero-hour match is supposed to entail, but it's going to feature Willow Nightingale and Tomorrow Ishii versus Chris Statlander and Stokely Hathaway. Uh, this is probably, I'm assuming, like the an opener match, a pre-show match, something along those lines, because this feels like you could just throw this on any old collision and it would be totally fine. And then we get the Casino Gauntlet match for a guaranteed world title shot. I had to look this up legitimately. I didn't know what the fuck this was uh, when I was looking at it. Because to me, a gauntlet match is you have so many participants coming in and you have to be uh, pinned or you're submitted to be eliminated. But apparently this is a one fall to finish from what I understand. It's like if you were to have a Royal Rumble, but instead of the Royal Rumble participants being eliminated by throwing, getting thrown over the top rope, this match could end at any time via pinfall or submission. So in theory, you should have 
versions of this match where the match ends before all of the available participants are even able to come out for the match. So, you know, if there's 20 participants for this match and there's 10 people in the ring and somebody eats a, a pinfall or a submission, like the match is over, right? As far as I understand. So I think the concept of the match is kind of stupid, but it's pro wrestling. They're going to work it. I think the most interesting thing about this is uh, the participants and how they're going to be involved. I think, obviously, Adam Hangman Page declaring himself for the uh, Casino Gauntlet match puts him in as a, fev- uh, as a heavy favorite. However, I, I think he's a favorite regardless. Actually, I was going to say, however, you know, given that the Daniel Bryan stipulation almost makes it that he has to win that match and that the story to tell with Hangman is really more with Swerve, I could see it being a situation where that's how you get the title back to Swerve, is you have Daniel Bryan beat Swerve, and then you have Adam Hangman Page beat Daniel Bryan, and now you have your Adam uh, Page and Swerve Strickland feud again, but you have the title on Hangman this time. So I and I think that's an interesting way to go about it. Kind of delays that feud a little bit, and then you could have Swerve take the title off him, and then that, continue that feud for that could be like a, a full on blood feud over the title for a long time. Uh, but also, uh, I was uh, doing a little bit of investigating and reading Ricochet. You know, having uh, have has apparently signed an AEW contract, and this could be his debut is participating in this casino gauntlet match. Um, I think Ricochet and AEW, uh, after having left WWE, a very natural fit. Obviously, uh, everyone is already clamoring for the Will Ospreay Ricochet ninja matches, uh, but there's a plethora of uh. Uh, studs and stars on this roster for Ricochet to compete with. Um, I think he's going to be able to have the type of matches that he really, you know, couldn't have to a degree in WWE. So I I think that's going to be interesting. But if I had to predict a winner for this, I I do think it's going to end up being Hangman, Hangman Page. I think the story with him and Swerve and the story with him and uh, Debray also and their history, I think uh, he just makes the most sense. Next up, we have the London ladder match for the AEW World Trios Championship. So I'm assuming this is just a ladder match. Uh, But we get the Bang Bang Gang of Juice Robinson and the Guns versus the House of Black. Versus the Patriarchy, which is Christian Cage, Nick Wayne, and Killswitch. Versus a mystery team. Um, I have no idea who the mystery team is going to be. I genuinely don't know who's going to win this match. I feel like I could literally go anyway. Like, there's... This is very much, to me, a 25% split where every single uh, team has just as much of a chance to win as the other. I think those World Trio Championships get tossed around a little bit. I will say the one thing is I don't think the Bang Bang Gang is going to retain. I think it's going to end up being a mystery team or the House of Black that, that pulls down those titles, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, but either way, a 12-man ladder match uh, should be pretty intense and crazy. Uh, Christian, the innovator of ladder matches involved in the match as well. I think it'll be just a great match regardless. Uh, then we get into the AEW World Tag Team Championship, which I am actually just realizing is a triple threat match because it's FTR versus the Acclaimed versus the Young Bucks. I I think the acclaimed are going to win this match. I I have and again I'm coming in cold. I have not been watching this feud. I know that I know obviously FDR and the Young Bucks have a very long standing feud. Uh, the Young Bucks currently champions. I could see one of two situations. I think either the Young Bucks are going to retain and they're just going to keep the idea of the elite uh, that faction strong, 
But I could very much see a situation here where they claim to get a huge upset win, which in a sense would validate them as a tag team. I think you have a situation here where obviously the acclaimed as compared to FTR and the young bucks are um, not a lesser team, but um, I what's the word I'm looking for. They're obviously less decorated. Like they're less um, historic, I guess in the, ter- in terms of, how they relate to tag team wrestling and the company. I think it's, I, you know, I think there's a clear delineation between FGR, the young bucks, and then the acclaimed. And I think the way that you put them over in a meaningful way is have them win this match. I mean, you have both FTR and the young bucks involved. The fact that it is a triple threat, I think also creates a scenario where, it could be a like kind of a surprise win where you know the young bucks hit a finish or FER hits a finish and the acclaim kind of sneak in there and get the pin at the end. But I think this would be a good way to really validate the acclaimed as one of your elite echelon tag teams on the level of FTR and the Young Bucks. Because right now I think they're very popular, but still viewed as like a lesser tier and very much as like the third wheel in this match. And I think the way to get out of that is just have them win the match. So my heart, I guess my heart, and I'm making the case for it with my head that the acclaimed are going to win this match. I do still think in the back of my mind that the young bucks are just going to retain, which would be the boring answer. But I guess I'm hoping that they decide, Hey, you know, we've got two legendary tag teams here. Both have held, tag gold we've had our own we've had our rivalry where it's just you know back and forth one of us has won uh the last seven fucking tag matches that we've had i think you know having the acclaim to go over in a surprise fashion would feel fresh also moving on the ftw championship hook versus chris jericho we do not need to spend a lot of time on this if hook does not win this match I should retire from doing AEW previews, just like Chris Jericho is being told to retire. Now, I am not on the bandwagon of he needs to retire. But at the same time, I understand the pushback of there's no scenario situation where Chris Jericho should be going over your younger talent. Like, he never should have won the title from Hook in the first place. This whole storyline with Hook has been complete bullshit. Um, Probably one of the worst things on AEW TV right now is this Chris Jericho learning tree garbage. The thing is, Jericho's not bad. Like, he still can go in the ring for a 50-year-old. Like, he still can do some things on the mic, but it really needs to... He needs to be placated in a sense and relegated is the thing. Like you cannot have situations where Chris Jericho is a true focal point of your programming in 2024. Like, you know, if anybody should be on a fucking retirement tour right now, it's not Daniel Bryan, it's Chris Jericho. Uh, But again, I think Chris Jericho could be doing a lot of amazing things in AEW. I just, there's, I don't, I don't think there's a reason for him to have prolonged feuds with any one individual person. Like, you know, the learning tree shtick and and gimmick, uh, actually, I felt like had an opportunity more as a face than as a heel. So you have this idea that, Jericho is, you know, trying to guide the young lions in AEW. And I think you could have told an interesting story of him trying to impart that wisdom, but losing those matches against these young up and coming studs. Uh, And I think the way that you could tell those stories is that the the young lions are able to use kind of pure athleticism and strength uh, or endurance or some other factor other than just technique to basically outlast Chris Jericho, who is getting into the later stages of his career. And he's having to find ways around that kind of, you know, a la late stages Ric Flair. 
I think that would be a lot more interesting of a story arc for Chris Jericho as opposed to, like, again, the idea that guys are supposed to sell for him like a main eventer. Like, the Judas effect is the dumbest fucking finisher. Like, I just... It's funny because I, I have, I think, a... I've developed a true love-hate relationship for Chris Jericho, and so I understand where a lot of the hate comes from and why fans are chanting, please retire. But at the same time, I do feel like this is a little bit disrespectful for a guy that, like, I mean, Chris Jericho, of all people, too, like, has known kind of when to go away and come back and reinvent himself. I think the thing with AEW is that he's comfortable. And, um, you know, shout out to going in Raw, Steven Larson, they kind of mentioned too that the difference is, you know, when he was with AEW or when he was with WWE, uh, like if he had a Fozzie tour coming up or some bullshit like that, he would just fuck off, go do that for a while and then come back. Now with AEW, it's like a lot of those dates kind of work and commingle. He's he's able to, you know, stay longer without having to take extended breaks. And it's almost working to his detriment at this point because this latest reinvention of himself has been absolute just fucking unwatchable bullshit. So I said I wasn't going to spend too long on that, and I spent way too long on that. Uh, coffin match between, for the TNT Championship. Darby Allen versus Jack Perry. That's going to be one crazy, awesome match. But I have Jack Perry winning this match. As much as I hate to admit it, Jack Perry has been doing his best work since the whole uh, CM Punk incident. The way that they've um, been able to use the scapegoat character, I can't lie. I think Jack Perry has really established himself uh, as a heel uh, in a way where I'm able to take him seriously. You know, I think uh, just going back to the previous match uh, with Hook, as much as I love Hook, I really struggle to take Hook serious as like this, you know, super tough, like, um, you know, uh, uh, soft spoke is not the word I'm looking for. It's uh, silent but deadly, like that that kind of persona of like, oh, he's just an ice cold killer, and then he comes out, he looks like a fucking fourteen year old. Like, I'm sorry. It, there's a cognitive dissonance that I struggle with with uh, Hook and the character that he is supposed to play. And then I look at a guy like Jack Perry, and I could see myself having that same issue. And yet, like I said, with the work that he's been doing, the way that he's uh, been able to use this scapegoat character to elevate his heel work, I think has been tremendous. Um, and I do think that he's going to retain in this match. Uh, as much as I love Darby Allen, I think Darby Allen is a perfect opponent to legitimize this TNT title run that Jack Perry is on. And so I am predicting that he's going to win that match. Next, we get the AEW American Championship, Will Ospreay versus MJF, running it back. Um, the tremendous, uh, I think it was the Iron Man match or whatever it is. Uh, no, it wasn't. An Iron Man match. It was just a match that went like almost damn near an hour, almost hit the time limit. That's what it was. Uh, killer fucking match, though. Osprey versus MJF, uh, where MJF ultimately cheated to win the American Championship. And then, uh, and now you've had like the, especially, you know, obviously the latest promo from MJF calling out Osprey's wife. And the fact that he won't use the Tiger Driver, and so it almost guarantees that we're going to see the Tiger Driver in, in this match. I don't know exactly how they are going to top that first match. I don't know that they even necessarily have to. I think, I think the way that they should do it is just come out and actually do like a 15 to 20 minute just blaze of glory banger. I'm very interested to see, though, who wins this match. I This one, I feel like, is very much a coin toss. I think this could just as easily be Osprey winning as it could be MJF. Uh, my 
uh, my final thought I do think is Osprey is ultimately going to win back his title. <coughs> I think <coughs> it'll end on a sequence of him questioning whether to use the Tiger Driver, ultimately deciding to use it because MJF uh, was such an asshole during this the run up to this match, which is you know every MJF uh, feud and promo basically. But I think Will Ospreay probably walks away with the title, though, again, not a lot of confidence points on it. Uh, But ultimately, I don't have a lot to say either. This is just going to be one banger of a match. Uh, For the TBS championship, we have Britt Baker versus Mercedes Monet. This is officially where, you know, it feels like uh, as much as, like, I – I'm glad that they're highlighting the women. Uh, the fact that the AEW already has a women's mid-card title in the TBS championship, uh, it just kind of goes, speaks to what I feel like is an issue, overarching issue with them of just like how many titles they have in general and how hard it is to keep track of that. Uh, but for the TBS championship, you have Britt Baker versus Mercedes Monet, uh, with Britt Baker having returned to AEW. This has been the big feud that's been set up. I do think Mercedes Monet is going to win this match. Uh, much to the chagrin of AEW fans, I would like to see Britt Baker win here. Um, but I think they're going to I think they're going to continue this feud is what it is. And so I think to be able to do that, I mean, you could have Britt Baker win the championship and have Mercedes Monet go after it, but I think the way that they are going to protect Monet's character, the way that she's set up in AEW, um, also just like in the background from a real life perspective behind the curtains, I do think Mercedes Monet is going to retain the TBS championship and this feud will continue and uh, Britt Baker might take it off for the next time. The AEW Women's World Championship. Uh, now, this is where it gets juicy. You've got Timeless Tony Storm versus Mariah May. Uh, obviously attacked her and left her a bloody mess. Um, so I think this is very much a situation where Mariah May should go over here. But I don't know if she will. I think... And, you know, it's hard because I love Tony Storm. I think Tony Storm, uh, however much hate she might get from uh, some trolls in the internet wrestling community, especially like when they tried to do that women of wrestling stuff, her and Soraya with the catch can wrestling, uh, but they kind of were a little offbeat with it. And so it looked awkward. I love uh, Tony Storm. I love the character, timeless Tony Storm. I love all the work that she uh, has done. She makes, she cracks me up so much, uh, even just being on uh, simple things like commentary, telling uh, Taz it's not pronounced suplex, it's pronounced souple. That kind of shit literally pops me all the time. But I do think that she's had uh, an extended run with that AEW Women's World Championship. I think I think Mariah May should go over. I, the, the thing is, I question – my problem is wrestling logic kind of fights it, right? When you get left bloody the way that Tony Storm was left bloody, it almost necessitates her getting some kind of revenge in this match and ultimately being able to defend the Women's World Championship. I think that's kind of the chalk – uh story finish outline and how this match will end but in my heart of hearts i would like to see mariah may actually just kind of uh come in you know maybe be able to mess with tony psychologically and pull out them i think it would be better long term for their storytelling if they could put this title on mariah may and then the final countdown Title versus career for the AEW World Championship. Swerve Strickland versus Brian Danielson. So let's tease the opposite because I can tell you that I firmly believe there's almost no chance Brian Danielson is not winning this championship. Uh, and I'll, 
just to quickly highlight that before we get into like let's you know explore the alternative there i think swerve strickland unfortunately has been overlooked as aew champion uh, and i'm talking about uh from the perspective of tony khan from the way that he has been booked the way that he's featured on match cards um as much as i love swerve strickland i do think that his title reign ultimately not that it's been a failure in any shape or sense but i do think that it could end like i there's not there you know what i'm saying there's no gravitas right now uh, in terms of swerve's title run now i'll talk about this for the flip side of the argument I think one of the ways that you could add that gravitas would be for him to go over clean in this match and retire Daniel, uh, Brian Danielson. <clears throat> I don't think that's what's going to happen, though. I do think Tony Khan wants Brian Danielson to get a world title run in AEW before retiring. Uh, I do think that uh, Brian Danielson himself has six to eight to maybe 12 months left on his retirement tour in his own mind of, you know, matches and feuds that he still wants to have before hanging up the boots. Now, maybe I'm wrong about all of that, but I really, like, to me, in, in terms of how I view this, I think there's almost no chance that we're not getting Brian Danielson as AEW world champion coming out of this, especially with, it being uh, title versus career. Now, to explore the alternative, I think if if they want to really cement Swerve Strickland as a true AEW centerpiece and main eventer in the eyes of even a casual fan, you need something big like this. I would quantify and qualify this almost to when Brock Lesnar broke Undertaker's streak. That was something that they could point to in promos for like the next however many years of, you know, he broke the streak, the, the, the one in 21 and one. Now, if Swerve Strickland is able to retire Daniel Bryan for realsies, right? So let's just assume that we get the match. Uh, it's a clean finish. Swerve Strickland retains and Bryan Danielson is forced to retire. That becomes a, a moment of gravitas that Swerve can now point to for that legitimizes his title run in a way that none of his other matches have for the rest of the time that he is AEW world champion. I retired Brian Danielson. I retired one of the greatest wrestlers in the history of our generation and any generation. And that's something that he can use going forward of like, oh, you're going to challenge me? I retired da uh, Brian Danielson. Like, who are you? So I think there is something to be said for how good this would be for Swerve Strickland. You could make potentially, and again, Swerve's already like a guy. I don't want this to sound like I'm saying like, you know, Swerve is, but again, the way that Swerve, I think everyone would recognize, like, they've had issues where they put out the match cards and uh, Swerve is, like, in the middle uh, of, of, like, the match card and it, it it's in, like, real tiny print AEW World Champion. Like, if you were just a casual walking by looking at the poster, you wouldn't know that that was your world champion and supposed to be, like, the main event guy. I think this is the type of win that would really like solidify again the way Brock Lesnar was already an established character the way that he was able to elevate when he came back from UFC and then beat Taker the way that that became such a notch in his belt that it made almost like again in kayfabe it made it so that future opponents had to be like oh shit he did that like almost like a instills a level of uh, respect and fear in your future opponents to have such a great accomplishment. I think that's really the only argument you could make 
for Swerve Strickland winning this match. But I do ultimately think it's going to be Brian Danielson. Um, if if Brian Danielson decided to hang up his boots though and have this be the last match, I think all in at Wembley Stadium in front of 80,000 screaming fans uh, and in a way that would, again, cement Swerve Strickland, I think, as a true main event superstar for AEW for years to come. I I would understand it. It, it would hurt still, but I, I would I would understand it. But I do think Brian Danielson's coming out with that title. That's it for me today. I super appreciate you guys stopping in and checking out this preview and prediction show. We will be back. Um, I'm going to have to pre-record another episode for next week because uh, I will be out of town for Labor Day weekend. But hopefully uh, the week after that, uh, I think it would be September 7th. We will be back live. Uh, probably either, uh, I don't know, maybe we'll do something fun. Maybe we'll do another like top 10 episode or something like that. Um, or we'll, we might be doing a review of Bash at excuse me, bash at the Berlin by then or something along those lines. So we shall see. But I appreciate you guys so much. Uh, Thank you for watching. Make sure you super kick that subscribe, like, all that stupid algorithmic bullshit. Uh, More importantly, if you guys have ideas uh, for the show or, like, questions or stuff you want to see on the show, you can hit me up at Jack Lusne on all of my socials. Uh, You can also send emails to worstsportschannel at gmail.com. Uh, but yeah, till the next time, I'll catch all of you guys on the flip side. My positive contact results in affirmative impact. Never pulled a rats on raps. I'm never primitive, but animalistic, vicious. Characteristics, hereditary potency, epicetic genes, yo. Ever the HMCs at extraordinary speed. Some of the beers like, some of the razor blades and grease in your bare feet. I see your fucking colleagues misprize you very much to your dismay. So today, I can say you won't be running away. Hold your tail between your legs. I'm gonna advocate when you fail with low stakes. I'll take a hack. To you cockeyed, mumble rap, slack jaws Leave you shredded on a side like some coleslaw The double time with the clothesline from hell like Bradshaw I'm toxic like septic shot A dying breed like anorak